has been World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Tomorrow, Tim Melton has sports and Roland Govan's weather. Now, Channel 13 Eyewitness News. Good evening, everyone. You are looking at aerial shots of a sulfur dome at the coastal sulfur plant in Channel View. A fire has been burning there since about noon. Sulfur dioxide is escaping into the air, and the leaking fumes have forced the evacuations of some three to 4,000 people. The story of this fire and the evacuations that necessarily followed have been developing all afternoon. Right now, our Wayne Doltrefino, who's been in Channel View most of the afternoon, is standing by with the latest on the story. Wayne, what's going on there? Yes, so Melanie and Van, emergency units continue to go down Sheldon Road. The fire at the Silver Dome is actually a mile down this road, right along the ship channel along Peninsula, at a place called Coastal Sulfur Plant. And the fire, we are told, is now under control. And perhaps in a couple of hours, those 4,000 Channel View residents who have been forced in the last couple of hours to evacuate to shelters will be allowed to return home. Fire started just about noon today, actually started in an 18-wheeler located at the plant. The fire spread from there to a front end loader and then to the sulfur dome itself, a big area. And once the sulfur dome began to burn, uh, there were significant problems. Channel View volunteer firemen came to the scene first, to followed by the Cloverleaf Volunteer Fire Department. And then they called in for some help from the Houston Fire Department and their hazardous materials truck. Joining us now, the chief of the Channel View Volunteer Fire Department, Chief Robert Reichel. Uh, you volunteers got there around noon today and uh, tried unsuccessfully to keep this fire from spreading to the sulfur dome. Once it did, though, Chief, uh, you had your work cut out for you. Yes, sir. Uh... We actually received a call about 12:15, like you did say, the 18-wheelers burning, and it spread into large mounds of sulfur burning, which caused the toxic fumes to come off, and and we all had to be in our air packs and things of that nature. We uh, did receive assistance from Highlands Fire Department and Cloverleaf with air packs and uh, added uh, trucks and water. Once it got larger than what we could handle, we called in Houston, who were here almost immediately with I don't know how many units they brought in, but really worked real good with us. And right now they're surrounding the fire with aerials and just drowning the large mounds of sulfur. And it is looking pretty good at this time. It's amazing that none of your men had to be hospitalized because uh, they were there when, uh, when the sulfur started burning. Yeah. Well, just because we was able to have our air packs there and, and we had to wear the air packs to go into it is the only reason no one had to be hospitalized because there was some heat exhaustion and things of that nature. But luckily, no one had to go to the hospital. And I'm unaware, I uh, don't know of anyone having to go to the hospital from this, residents or firefighters. Of course, so the big concern, as the chief said, was the burning sulfur. And once the sulfur dioxide from that fire began to be released, uh, the firemen here at the scene quickly called for a mandatory evacuation of about a mile area around the ship channel affecting some 4,000 Channel View residents. Sheriff's deputies went door to door to coordinate the evacuation of about 4,000 Channel View residents. This is a mandatory evacuation. The area is bordered on the east by the East Belt, on the north by the East Freeway, on the west by Cedar Lane near Cedar Bayou, and on the south by the Houston Ship Channel. Two evacuation centers began filling up about 4 o'clock this afternoon. One boy with two broken legs had to be brought in by ambulance to one of the shelters. The sulfur dioxide fumes being released by the fire are especially dangerous to the young and the elderly. 96-year-old Laura Booker evacuated a Ship Channel retirement home. Well, the police were saying they were clearing the house. He said something so terrible's happened. The two evacuation centers set up so far are both located along Sheldon Road. One at St. Andrew's Church at 837 Sheldon, the other at the intermediate school at the intersection of Sheldon and U.S. Highway 90. As we said, it should be just a couple of hours now that the fire is under control, but those folks at St. Andrews and the intermediate school will be allowed to return home. Of course, there is some concern about some long-term environmental damage in the ship channel because the water the firefighters that have been using has run off with the sulfur into the channel. The Environmental Protection Agency and the Coast Guard have been notified, so there might be some long-term effects to today's fire. But for right now, the immediate danger seems to be passing. Melanie, Van? Wayne, real briefly, uh, any people there, any residents in that area are reporting any respiratory problems? I tell you what, Van, you're going to have to repeat that. One of those 18-wheelers leaving the ship channel <laughs> just passed me. Yeah, any respiratory problems reported by any of the residents before or after they were evacuated? Uh, as we know right now, there has been nobody who has had to be hospitalized. And since the sulfur dioxide is still in the air, let me quickly point out that if you smell the sulfur, and you'll know when you smell it, 
Um, what you should do, because it is uh, very dangerous to the eyes and to the nose, is to get a filter or a napkin and place it over your face to protect yourself. One other point, uh, because there is still a chance the winds could change and the smoke could move to another direction, uh, if you think you need to evacuate and have somehow been missed by the sheriff's deputies, civil defense at 222-3901. 222-3901 says they'll come and get you if you need some help. But as far as we know, everybody's out of the area and everybody seems to be okay. Okay, Wayne, thank you very much for that report. Well, there is other news this afternoon. Two unidentified Houston men died this afternoon when the plane on which they were flying lost power and crashed in the backyard of a Santa Fe house. Jamie O'Rourke reports numerous Santa Fe residents helplessly witnessed that crash. Rescue workers righted the black and yellow bi-wing sports plane, which crashed upside down in the backyard of this Santa Fe home, not 35 feet from the house. Gary Wyndham was inside the house having lunch at the time. I heard a whistling for about three seconds. I felt, I felt the impact. I heard it. It shook the, uh, some of the windows in the house and the door. At first, I didn't know what to think. It just... How often does an airplane plane land in your backyard? According to officials, pilot and passenger out for an apparent pleasure flight were killed instantly in the spiraling nosedive smash-up. The cause has not yet been determined. There were witnesses to this crash, but until it finally hit the ground, some thought it was just a stunt. It looked like he was pulling a stunt, you know? Well, at first I thought he was, but after I seen him at a certain height, they usually don't wait that long before they start pulling out, and I said, he's, gonna, he's just going to crash. Another witness thought he heard engine problems. Did you hear the engine on? It was on at the time, but it, the throttle kind of shut down. Because of leaking fuel, firefighters roped off the crash site and kept a watchful eye, but there were no flames or smoke coming from the craft when it was in the air or on the ground. In a residential area like this, an explosion on impact could have raised the death toll and made this crash even more tragic. In Santa Fe, Jamie O'Rourke, Eyewitness News. Air Force officials tonight are investigating the crash of a twin-engine military jet that killed two airmen. Air Force officials say that both pilot Captain Michael Kafori and Airman First Class Russell Hunziker of Austin were killed instantly. The reconnaissance jet crashed on a ranch outside of Azona, Texas yesterday afternoon during routine exercises. The aircraft was assigned to Bergstrom Air Force Base. Drivers on the Southwest Freeway in the West Loop this morning might have thought they were watching a Houston version of the Indianapolis 500. A sports car led a trail of Houston police on a wild chase through Southwest Houston. Eyewitness News reporter Wayne Doltrefino says two police cars were damaged while the driver of the sports car got away. Officer J.R. DeGenero thought he was keeping Houston streets safe this Memorial Day weekend when he decided to pull over a driver of a Camaro Z28 on Westheimer to tell him to slow it down and put on his seatbelts. He never imagined he would be triggering a high-speed chase that would reach speeds in excess of 100 miles per hour that would damage two police cars. I noticed there was four guys in the car that were doing a little over the speed limit. They weren't wearing the seatbelts. So I turned around with the holiday weekend and all to just tell him, hey, buckle up. This is, you know, bad weekend. Turned around, they went northbound on Taft. I got behind them. They turned westbound on Avondale, and I turned around. I noticed they were speeding on Taft. Picked up more speed on Avondale. I got behind them. I grabbed. As soon as I grabbed my mic to put the chase out, boom, they were gone. The chase wound through Montrose for a few minutes before the Camaro driver decided to ram the General's patrol car. They whipped around the oak tree, came head on at me. That's where we had a collision. We hit head on, or actually, my buddy bumper caught the side of his car. He turned around again at me, and I caught him with the rear of my patrol car, so I hit him twice. Bel Air police units joined Houston police in the chase down Highway 59 in the 610 loop. The general then crashed, trying to avoid another car. The chase lasted 25 minutes and ended here in this apartment complex in the 9700 block of Capri. Police found the car in a back alley, but the folks inside were gone. Jimmy Jones was driving by this apartment complex when the silver Camaro came flying to a halt in the alley. He saw three of the four suspects run into a nearby apartment complex. They were moving so fast, you know, it all, it all happened so fast. So, you know, I just kind of, I said, well, I didn't see any police around. I said, well, maybe it's not nothing. Maybe they're just running rubber for the, you know, devil of it. Patrol officers pulled their weapons and searched nearby apartments, but came up empty-handed. But since the car comes back registered to a Galveston man and has not been reported stolen, they don't think it will be very tough to find the man who patrol officers say must have been crazy after leading police on this Saturday morning version of the Indianapolis 500. 
Wayne Dolcefino, Eyewitness News. Well, police have had their hands full elsewhere this weekend. Warnings haven't kept the throngs away from the summit office. That's where the rocket tickets go on sale tomorrow. People want to know not who's on first, but who is first. That story shortly. It started with two men arguing about whether to wake up one of the men's wives. It ended with a husband's death. 27-year-old Kirk Douglas Guilford was seen arguing with another man in the parking lot of Calvin's Diner in the 1400 block of Hill. Police say that was about 2 o'clock. Apparently they got in a shoving match. The suspect went inside Calvin's and uh, got a revolver from behind the counter, came back out and shot the complainant several times. Guilford somehow managed to run several blocks. He was bleeding, bleeding profusely. He finally collapsed in the 2600 block of Lyons Avenue. He died at that spot moments later. Police now are looking for the man they believe shot Guilford, 33-year-old Donald Ray Young. So far this Memorial Day weekend, traffic accidents have claimed more than 28 lives nationwide. At least three of those deaths have come in Texas, but state and local law enforcement officials are teaming up to try to keep the count down. Extra DPS patrol cars are on state highways and freeways this weekend. And here in the Houston area, the DWI task force was out in full force last night. The task force arrested 116 people overnight for driving while intoxicated. Those suspected of DWI were asked to perform three simple tests. Recite the alphabet, lift one foot, and count to 30. Breathalyzers were also administered. Well, I think they're real effective. I think it shows, too, to the community that we're finally putting an emphasis on drunk driving. The problem now is with the court system. Uh, it's up to them. I do the hard part, and it's up to them to follow through with it. Drivers should be warned that officers are looking for speeding drivers, drunk drivers, and people who are not wearing their seat belts this weekend. And on a happier note, if you think the Rockets fans don't have the fever, think again. First of all, anyone who would sit, much less stand in the afternoon sun today, has to be feverish. But that's exactly what several dozen of the faithful are doing. They have set up uh, chaise lounges, lawn chairs, and whatever. The far side had brought along food and something to drink. The Rockets' first home game, June 1st, already is sold out, and these people will have to wait until 2 o'clock Sunday morning until they can get tickets to game four. The next 10 hours is going to be hectic, because if they don't get any law and order out here, you know... It's going to be kind of wild. It's going to be, you know, got to wait and see what's going to happen. If we can get some cooperation from the uh, security that this is the beginning of the line, we'll be all right. I came out here early this morning, but they ran me off, so I went and had lunch and came back. So what do you do for 10 or 20 hours while you're waiting for that ticket window to open? Hang around, listen to music, just mess around. 
I went to the post office and happened to drive past there earlier this afternoon. It was like a great big picnic. People talking to people they hadn't known just a few hours ago. And as we, oh yeah, but we saw the only thing that they really seem to be worried about is, is that going to be the start of the line or somewhere else? I don't blame them. I'd be worried about that too. At least it's nice to know that the police aren't chasing them off again like they yeah, were the other day. Yeah, exactly. And speaking of the Rockets, Rockets getting ready to leave for Boston. Rah, rah. And the Astros are in danger of leaving first place. We have those stories coming up next in sports. Well, everybody around town has been worried about the Rockets meeting the Celtics, but I think the Astros are beginning to feel a little bit slighted. They were doing so well earlier in the season. That's right, and uh, so they're going to show us. If yep. we're not going to pay attention, they're going to lose, <laughs> apparently. Right. Uh, Astros started the season finding ways to win. They are now finding ways to lose. Fell to the Cubs for the second straight day this afternoon, 4-3 the final. There was some good news, however. Mike Madden got the start. He took a 3-0 lead into the sixth inning, which is all manager Hal Lanier could ask for. It was 1-0 Astros in the sixth. Hits by Gardner Cruz, a sacrifice fly, and that Kevin Bass double gave Madden the 3-0 lead. But the bullpen couldn't protect the lead for the first time this year. Kerfield gave up runs in the sixth and the seventh. And then Alan Ashby let the Dave Smith pitch get by there. Runner from third, Mumphrey scores to tie it up. Then on the infield out, the winning run scores. The Astros go meekly in the ninth, and the final was 4-3 Cubs. But there is some good news on the horizon. San Francisco may lose yet again. Montreal leads it in the seventh inning. Over in the American League, the Yankees took a 6-4 lead over California. Solo homer by Dave Winfield just curved inside the foul pole. But it took a two-out ninth inning single by Mike Pagliarulo to score Ken Griffey with the game winner. Pagliarulo, that's right. And California loses 7-6. Toronto 9-6 over the Indians this afternoon. Rockets worked out at uh, HBU this afternoon. Final workout before they get on the plane at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, Intercontinental Airport, Terminal C. You should be used to that by now. But then they will head for Boston in Monday's first encounter with the Celtics. And, of course, uh, there is a Celtic mystique along with a Celtic talent that the Rockets must conquer. But they also had to overcome a Laker mystique that was a result of years of Western Conference domination, last year's NBA title. And it's the maturity the Rockets have displayed in the playoffs that has been the key. The talent has always been there. But now they believe in their talent, and much of the credit for that belongs to Bill Fitch. He says little things to us that uh, let us know uh, we can't get overconfident and to the point where we're not doing what we need to do. Uh, he stresses the basic things. This was our goal from the very beginning. And right now, I don't think any guy is looking and saying, well, here we are. I'm just happy to be here. Next year we come back. No, our ultimate goal is we're going to win. Coach is going to say the right words to get us motivated, if not before the game or during halftime. You know, it's not news to say much of the Rockets' success will depend upon how much success Akeem has. But Akeem will have far less to worry about than his teammates because the grand history of the Boston Garden means nothing to a former soccer player from Nigeria. I don't know much about the history. I'm just going there to win. That's all. Yeah, Akeem follows the if you, what you don't know can't hurt you theory. Uh, this has been a year of Jack Nicklaus on the PGA Tour. He stunned the world when he won at the Masters. Uh, his presence completed a perfect week at the Houston Open, and now his own Memorial Golf Tournament is witnessing some brilliant golf. Take a look at the shot coming up because you ain't going to believe it. Dan Halderson from the rough at 14. The ball lands on the green far left of the hole, rolls up the bank, but look at it. It's going to roll back down the bank. Where do you think it's going to end up? You got it. It's an eagle. Uh, but the lead belongs to Hal Sutton, who nailed this eagle putt at 15, followed with three birdies to take the lead at 13 under par. Nicholas is in sight. He is eight under par. Tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock when the Rockets are leaving Intercontinental, that's going to be about the same time that Rick Mears will take the green flag to get the Indy 500 underway. Mears and teammate Danny Sullivan are the race favorites, not just because they're good drivers, but because they drive for Roger Penske. 
People try to put percentages on, you know, the, the equipment and the team and, you know, back and forth compared to the driver. And, and it's, uh, you know, the car can't go around there without us, and, and I can't go around there without a car, definitely. You know, it, it takes everybody pulling together to make the thing work. NASCAR will be running tomorrow at the Charlotte Motor Speedway, the NASCAR 600, and it's not known if Richard Petty will be driving. Now, he says he will, but yesterday he was pulled from his car unconscious after suffering a mild concussion. He was released from the hospital this morning. The Indy 500, I want a reminder, can be seen live for the first time ever in that race's history. Tomorrow morning, the race should get underway about 11 o'clock. And also the fifth in what could be the final game of the Montreal-Calgary series in the Stanley Cup will also be played tonight. They had a fight bench clearing brawl after the game was over in game four so there may be some excitement they tonight. should learn from the rockets and do their fighting during the game that's, that's right you get the right guy thrown out and then you come back and you win every time that's right that's how you do it the game broke out before the fight yes. <laughs> <laughs> well it's going to be hotter in houston roland has weather coming up next and still ahead even those yankees up in boston know what's hot as far as clothes are concerned we're going to show you shortly Violent thunderstorm up in Fort Worth this afternoon a few hours ago, and uh, the roof literally fell in in a bowling alley. At least six people injured up there, they Soft say. Softball size hail. Oh, Can you imagine a, a, a bowl of ice or a ball of ice that big falling? on top of your building and the storms are still continuing it's the same kind of pattern uh, that we've had last weekend you remember at this time we were talking about severe weather here in the Houston area well it continues once again up in northeastern areas of Texas this is a severe thunderstorm watch which remains in effect for portions of northeast Texas until 7 this just issued at about 5 o'clock that a severe thunderstorm war, uh, watch and in effect at 11 o'clock tonight some very heavy thunderstorms are expected once again it's that moisture coming off the Gulf of Mexico some cooler drier air behind it typical spring light weather that results in some severe thunderstorms and very warm temperatures. 91 the current temperature in San Antonio, 89 Del Rio, 93 in Midland and behind the front just a bit cooler but much drier, 73 in Amarillo. We'll look at the Texas radar and you'll see some very heavy thunderstorms now going on up in the lakes area. Lake Sam Raver and Lake Livingston are receiving some very heavy thunderstorms, gusty winds. As a matter of fact, the northern areas of Houston County and also in Nacogdoches County under a severe thunderstorm warning that for the next uh, few minutes or so you see the areas of very intense uh, red here and even some black indicating some very heavy thunderstorms. All this activity drifting towards the northeast at about 15 to 25 miles per hour. As far as we're concerned, generally a nice day, plenty of sunshine, very warm temperatures. 76 was a low this morning, that coming at 6 o'clock. Afternoon high 92, missed that uh, record high by about 3 degrees. No rain in the past 24 hours. Intercontinental Airport, current temperature 90 degrees here at the station, 86. Hobby reporting 86 as well. The barometer falling, winds quite gusty out of the southeast. Humidity right smack dab in the middle at 50%. Well, we're nearing hurricane season here in the Gulf of Mexico and across most of the eastern portions of the country. Well, out in the Pacific, they've already began it. The first uh, tropical storm, Tropical Storm Agatha, developed uh, in the past 24 hours. The center of it generally located here. You see the bands of uh, heavier thunderstorms and squalls of very heavy thunderstorms. The black indicating the colder cloud tops, meaning the heavier precipitation. It should be able to uh, generate enough uh, energy to by tomorrow night, uh, meaning it could be turning into a hurricane, but it's moving towards the north west at about 10 to 15 miles per hour, but it is one of the first uh, tropical storms to develop uh, this season. 60 degree temperatures across most of the southeast, some cooler weather behind that front, but most of south Texas still uh, very, very warm and very, very humid. 
for tomorrow. Partly sunny skies should be a nice day, but look late in the afternoon for some possible uh, isolated showers uh, due to daytime heating. But the heavy thunderstorms will once again erupt from about Midland and also up around uh, Clovis, New Mexico, towards the northeast along the Red River and across northeast Texas. Some of those could be possibly severe and moving into our area by a Memorial Day, unfortunately. Galveston Bay waters for tonight and tomorrow. Slightly choppy to choppy winds quite gusty out of the southeast. Beach water temperature already getting near 80 degrees. South uh, winds are seas three to five feet winds out of the southeast at 15 to 20 knots. Here's your forecast. Partly sunny skies for tomorrow. Should be a nice day for a little picnic, but make sure it's earlier in the day. In the afternoon, you'll start seeing the clouds uh, begin to roll in. 71 for a low, 90 the afternoon high, just a slight chance of the afternoon rain. And then by Monday, unfortunately, for Memorial Day. But everybody will be inside watching the Lakers. I mean, the Rocket game. <laughs> the Lakers, <laughs> Rocket are, game. Right? Lakers are history. Gee. Boston. And and Slip is no. I'm so or sorry. Okay. Speaking of basketball, Boston Celtics fans may not be too fond of the Rockets, but boy, they sure love the outfits those Houstonians wear. We tell you about that when we come back. Well, I'm sure it comes as no surprise to you that rocket revelry has obviously reached a fever pitch in our city right about now. And when Houston pride gets a boost, so does our cowboy image. As Don Cobos reports from Boston, the Yankees are even donning western hats and kicking up their boots. Cowboy boots, belts, and buckles. No, this is not Houston, Dallas, or San Antonio. It's called El Paso, which is Texan enough, but it's located here in Boston, Massachusetts. The store is located along historic Newbury Street, which is this city's answer to Fifth Avenue in New York or Rodeo Drive in Los Angeles. Owner Henry Leventhal opened this Weston Ware store back in 1978. Eight years later, it's still in business, one of the few left in Boston. He opened before the urban cowboy arrived on the scene. And surprisingly, Leventhal says that fad almost closed his doors. I mean, there was this huge need for this stuff all over the country, and it was PR'd to death. He says now even New Englanders find Weston wear a staple of their wardrobes, and his customers support that claim. I wear my boots on weekends and so on, and uh, you know, it's accepted. No one says, you know, gee, you look a little funny. In fact, I find I wear them a little bit more going out or going out, you know, either we're going out to dinner or, or just going out on the town. But one difference Leventhal points to is style. People on the East Coast and the West Coast one is real different from what people in Texas want in terms of styling. You know, for instance, in Texas, everyone's re wearing real round toes now on their boots, and here we do mostly sharp toes. Sharp toes, round toes, lizard or ostrich, this Boston business is proof that Weston Ware is truly nationwide. Don Cobos, Eyewitness News, Boston. Well, they'll be ready when the Rockets come through there and boot them out. Sure, all, exactly. All we have to do now, <laughs> that's terrible. Get them to do the two-step. <laughs> Eyewitness News is coming up next, and we're going to recap Jim Rosenfield's series on cocaine. Just one of the things coming up on Eyewitness Houston. And we'll see you tonight at 10 o'clock. Have a good evening. Good night. Boot up.
4,000 evacuated in Channel View because of a chemical fire. That story at 10. Four thousand evacuated in Channel View because of a chemical fire. That's sports on the twenty-fifth anniversary of ABC's Wide World of Sports. Ambulance drivers refused to take a bedridden Houston man to a medical clinic because they said he's too heavy. Action 13's Marvin Zindler explained. Marvin. Dave, there really isn't any explanation. <laughs> Let me start all over again. Dave, there really isn't any explanation for stupidity. It seems that some folks just make up their own policies when they find it convenient to do so. Up until a year and a half ago, 59-year-old Marlon Bass was an active, alert, self-employed floor refinisher. Then he suffered two strokes, two heart attacks. Mr. Bass is now bedridden on oxygen and has no use of his arms or legs. His daughter Rhonda quit her job to take care of him because she refused to put him in a nursing home. They survive on a meager fixed income from Social Security and child support for her two youngsters. The additional problem is that Rhonda has no way to take her dad to his medical apartment at the Herman Hospital Clinic. Harris County Social Services was picking him up in an ambulance, but last time, ambulance attendants refused to transport Mr. Bass because why? They said he was too heavy. Mr. Bass weighs 269 pounds. When the ambulance drivers told you that your father was too heavy to carry to the clinic, what did you do? I called the supervisor with social services, and he told me that my dad weighed too much, that they did not carry anyone over 245 pounds. So he told me to call Gulf Coast, United Ways, Metrolift, or American Red Cross, and maybe they could help me. I called all four of them, and they do not carry stretcher patients. Well, I went directly to the Harris County Social Services offices and confronted oh. Assistant Director Bill Greer with the fact that a seriously ill man was denied transportation to get medical treatment because he's too heavy. Isn't that kind of stupid? Well, that first of all, that's not our policy. It would be up to the supervisor to get extra help out to the field. Well, why didn't he do that? He said he didn't have anyone available at that point why in time. Didn't he, why didn't he come? Greer made no bones about it. The supervisor will come next time, and there will be a next time. We will provide transportation for her. How many people are you going to send out there? Uh, we are going to send a crew out there in addition to the supervisors going out there at uh, so we should have three or four people out there. So the supervisor will go this time then? The supervisor is going to go on, on uh, my recommendation. Now don't get me wrong, the Harris County Social Services do a great job when folks who are in dire need of assistance ask for help. As I've said in the past, it's hell to be poor and folks like Mr. Bass needs all the help he can get. I think those ambulance attendants and their supervisors should be told that if it happens again, out!
They go, Marvin Zindler, Eyewitness News. Okay, thank you, Marvin. With a victory at San Jacinto, the new Republic of Texas set about the task of forming a new stable government. And we'll have more on that and other news when Eyewitness News continues. Give them the satisfaction, Warden. Are you no good? Warden, they are knocking 5 to 40% off everything. Off everything? <clears throat> well, I'll have to come along strictly in an official capacity. Uh, Friday only. Get this 19-inch... $3. And this programmable digital audio displayer only $99. Save $100. Way to go, Rocky. You sure, Rock? Hey, Rocky. Could you pick me up a microwave? Sure, kid. Anything you want. <laughs> Highlands Midnight Madness Sale. Right. There's a common belief that the disease hypoglycemia, or low blood sugar, is a problem that affects adults only, but it is not. Untreated, it can cause severe mental retardation in infants. Medical reporter Mary Ellen Conway says that early treatment has been successful. Christina Martin was just 30 minutes old when her parents were told there was something wrong. At that time, they had no idea how serious the problem was. The nurses check all the newborn infants their uh, blood sugars and uh, then they told me that she had a low blood sugar and they were going to put an IV on her that it should just last a couple of hours. When Christina's blood sugar didn't come up to normal she was immediately transferred from Austin to Texas Children's Hospital. The diagnosis? Hypoglycemia of infancy. The opposite of diabetes instead of making too little insulin children with this condition make too much excess insulin pushes blood sugar levels down to dangerously low levels. The brain and other tissues in the body use glucose uh, as a fuel and if they're deprived of that then they can be damaged and damaged permanently uh, and this is really what used to happen to these babies if they survived they would have significant mental retardation. To keep that from happening Christina was given extra glucose by tube until doctors could surgically remove 95% of her pancreas. That's the organ which produces insulin. There may be some regrowth, but we hope that that regrowth will not, well, not hurt the baby in the future and that the effect of the regrowth will be to provide uh, enzymes for the gut and other, other things rather than too much insulin. The procedure worked and Christina is doing well. She's not awake now, but when she's awake, she's very alert. And when we got here, she was just uh, a little dish rag and now she's able to respond. What Christina's experience points out is how very important checking blood sugar levels at birth can be. Mary Ellen Conway, Eyewitness News. The Battle of San Jacinto back in 1836 ended the war for Texas independence, but it also raised a lot of problems. As we continue our series of reports in celebration of the Texas sesquicentennial, we find people in this area were confused, but they were determined to succeed. The Trail of Texas Independence, brought to you by American Airlines. The new Republic of Texas back in 1836 had a strange boundary, much different than it is today. The west and north borders reached up to what are now parts of Oklahoma, New Mexico, Kansas, Colorado, and Wyoming. But in the days immediately following the Battle of San Jacinto, what was important was the area right around here, southeast Texas. This is where the wheels of government were beginning to turn and the course for the new nation was being charted. General Sam Houston, bedridden with a shattered ankle received from a bullet during the final battle, remained at San Jacinto for nearly a month to write reports and get things sorted out. 
Other members of the Texas government, selected during the revolution and considered to be temporary, moved to the town of Columbia in Brazoria County. There, the first Congress met and decided on a general election later in the fall. The members also decided on moving the capital of Texas to a new site, to a settlement located about 50 miles to the north of Columbia, to a place that was later to be named Houston. But that was government, that was bureaucratic stuff. The bulk of the people here in 1836 were a determined breed. They had fled during the runaway scrape a month earlier, and now they were returning to pick up the pieces. Right. Thank you. Bless you. Oh. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Good job right here. Water. Oh, thank you very much. One old-timer referred to Texans as enterprising and persevering people. He said the timid and the lazy generally returned to the States. Bob Allen at the Astrodome for tonight's game. And to tell us more about the uh, wide world of sports anniversary, Bobby. Yeah, David, we're out here where the Astros play the Reds tonight. Uh, Astros, of course, in first place. They're in for four games. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's coming up on Saturday. We're at 7 o'clock, ABC's Wide World of Sports. Uh, we'll be celebrating 25 years on the air with a two-hour special. And many of the great moments from that anthology series will be relived by the man who has hosted the show as long as it's been on the air, Jim McKay. Jim McKay has traveled over 5 million miles in his 25 years as host of Wide World of Sports. He's seen everything from lumberjack contests to figure skating to wrist wrestling. But of all the events he's taken in, I asked which one event stood out the most. It used to be, I would say, uh, I don't know, there just have been too many of them. But after the hockey team in Lake Placid, it's easy because that was the most exciting sports event, I think. I've ever seen it. The hand is there, the puck is still loose. 11 seconds. You've got 10 seconds. The countdown going on right now. Morrow up to Silk. Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! Unbelievable. It had to be the greatest upset in sports history. I can't think of anything that comes even close. You know, you ask people, they say, well, 69 New York Mets or something, but that's not even close. Here's a, basically a bunch of American college kids beating not the best hockey team in the Olympics, but the best hockey team in the world, and then going on to win the gold medal. Five seconds to the gold medal, four to the gold medal. This impossible dream comes true! Coming at the time as it did, or the hostages still being held, a low point in our national spirits, suddenly that arena full of American flags waving, and then later, 
what, what I remember was the, the young people, the kids going through the streets of Lake Placid with American flags and singing God Bless America. It just hadn't been done in a long time. I remember my daughter uh, was at the game and she was sitting next to some guy, maybe 30, 32 years old, and all the flags were waving and he said, man, he said, the last time I saw this many American flags, we were burning them. Uh, that was a night. That, that was the night to remember, although I didn't do the play-by-play, -play, of course, how Michaels did it, but I was the host in the studio before and after and the aftermath. And that was it. Tell you what, it still gives me chills to, when you see that tape again. Saturday night at 7, they're going to relive all those great moments on Wide World of Sports' 25th anniversary show, and we'll live, relive some of the great moments from the Astros-Reds game tonight for you at 10 o'clock, Dave. Okay, get us a winner, Bob. All right. Well, AT&T says it wants to reduce the cost of our long-distance phone calls. We'll have that and more when we update World and National News in just a moment. touring sedan that defines driving as the greatest luxury of all, Acura Legend. Justice Department recommending that some strong action be taken against former U.N. Secretary General Kurt Waldheim. Sheriff Ryer is here with that and other world and national events of the day. Sheriff. Dave, just a short while ago, ABC News learned that the State Department's Office of Special Investigations is recommending that Kurt Waldheim be kept out of the U.S. because he's suspected of being a war criminal. Waldheim is the former U.N. Secretary General and he may be the next president of Austria. The Justice Department apparently is making the recommendation because of Yugoslavia's accusations that he played an active role under the Nazi regime in executing Jews and because of the German army unit file released by the World Jewish Congress. Waldheim's son defended his father. If they are only based upon the UN file, I know that we are talking about the tail end of a very unpleasant affair that has been disproven and I'm quite confident that uh, this matter will come to rest very soon. 
The U.S. Attorney General must now decide whether to act on the Justice Department's recommendations. Officials in Beirut defused a time bomb 15 minutes before it would have gone off outside the British Embassy, or I should say the British Library there. But in downtown London, officials did not find a bomb planted there in time. That bomb exploded early this morning. Two British groups have already claimed responsibility, and we get that story from Mike Lee. During the morning rush hour, police cordoned off Oxford Street department stores as the traditional clock chimes blended with another, less welcome bell. A bomb had exploded on the doorstep of a British Airways ticket office, which also houses counters for American Airlines and American Express. The blast occurred at 4.45 a.m. It's always very quiet at this time of day, I mean, quarter to five in the morning. And as, as I say, only one person was slightly injured. The concussion of the bomb shattered windows in several nearby buildings, including the famous Selfridges department store. Thousands of razor-like shards of glass had peppered the neighborhood like high-velocity shrapnel. If the blast had occurred a few hours later, police say the casualties could have been catastrophic. Only hours after the London bombing, the 12 common market interior ministers were meeting in The Hague, the Netherlands, to approve a new, far-reaching agreement to exchange anti-terrorist data with the United States. In West Germany today, Chancellor Kohl and French President Mitterrand met and agreed with President Reagan's wish that terrorism be a prime topic at next month's Western Economic Summit in Tokyo. Mike Lee, ABC News, London. Back on the home front, two women in Lexington, Kentucky were charged today with one of five murders last night. Lexington officials say the accused killers had been partying with all five people all afternoon and evening and had been drinking heavily. The victims were stabbed, run over by a car, shot or burned. Officials believe the motive was robbery. Well, if AT&T has its way, it will reduce the cost of long-distance calling by $1.5 billion, the largest rate reduction in the company's history. Unless the Federal Communications Commission objects, that price drop will go into effect automatically June 1st. Under the reductions, a 10-minute call from Houston to Atlanta during the day would cost $3.55, a savings of $0.42. Cents. A 10-minute call from Houston to Los Angeles during the evening would cost $2.13, down $0.31. Cents. The proposed reduction would be the third rate decrease in three years. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones closed up a fraction, about two points, at 1831.72. Volume on the big board was active at 146 million shares. And on the New York Mercantile, today's closing price for a barrel of West Texas Intermediate Crude Futures was $12.98, down 23 cents from yesterday. Arnold Arlen, whose work as a composer spanned half a century, died today in New York. Arlen won an Oscar for the song Over the Rainbow that Judy Garland immortalized in her 1939 role of Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. His other works include Stormy Weather and that old black magic. Arlen was 81 years old. And the Duchess of Windsor, the woman King Edward VIII gave up the throne to Mary in 1936, also died today near Paris at the age of 89. King Edward had to give up his throne because Baltimore socialite Wallace Simpson had been divorced twice. They lived in exile under the adopted titles of the Duke and the Duchess of Windsor. And she will be buried back in England, David. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Movie review up next. Ed will be back to update the weather. We'll have a final item. Stay with us.
two kinds of law, the one that's written and then Murphy's Law, that means anything that can go wrong usually will. Well, there's a new movie in town called Murphy's Law, and Jan Glenn has a preview. Murphy's Law is a thriller, and it stars Charles Bronson as a down-and-out detective who plays by his own rules. He angers a lot of people with his law, and he's framed for murder. We're under arrest, smart guy. Got a dozen witnesses. Ballistics identified your gun as the murder weapon. You're going to jail, Jack. I heard they arrested a cop. That foul-mouthed street kid to whom he is handcuffed upon his arrest is newcomer Kathleen Wilhoyt. When he escapes, he takes her with him, still attached and still screeching. Oh, my God, we're out of fuel! Oh, my God! I don't want to die. 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 Hey, die. we've already landed. Where are we? On a barn. A barn? He has to find out who set him up or he goes to prison for eight years. Now, this woman is the one. Joan Friedman, played by Carrie Snodgrass. A psychotic with a vicious vendetta against Murphy, his colleagues, his pals, and everyone who sent her to prison for murder. You can do better than that. Make it bigger. Ah. Uh, uh, uh. Perfect. You have to watch her closely because she has as many disguises as the number of Murphy's colleagues that she kills. And sometimes she's hard to recognize. It's rated R, and that's for nudity, bad language, violence, and sexual situations. It's a typical Charles Bronson movie with a lot of action and a lot of suspense. I think it's the best one he's ever made. If you're a Charles Bronson fan, you'll like it. Jen Glenn for Eyewitness News. Okay, let's go back to that to recap the weather picture. You take your whole family with that, if your family's the Borgias. <laughs> let's take a look at the forecasts. Uh, we're going to go through these really quickly. Tomorrow, sunny in Atlanta and in Boston, partly cloudy in Chicago and in Denver. In Detroit, partly cloudy. Kansas City, the same thing. Should be fair and warm in Las Vegas, fair and mild in Los Angeles. In New Orleans, sunny and warm. New York, sunny and mild. San Francisco, partly cloudy and mild. Cool to mild. Washington, sunny and warm. Here's the forecast for our area. Partly sunny skies. Low 60, high 82. Another day without rain, David. Looks like a nice weekend coming up. Thank you, Edward. Let's briefly recap some of today's top local news stories. Harris County Court has ruled today that five children who escaped an attempt by their mother to drown them will remain in protective custody of Harris County authorities, at least for the time being. Four of the youngsters remain in a hospital, one being diagnosed as having tuberculosis. A fifth child is living in a foster home. Houston police say now they're looking into the possibility that a fast food restaurant supervisor may have fled with some $3,500 in the company's cash receipts. 25-year-old Donald Miller was reported missing after his car was found abandoned in the parking lot of a bank where he had, was to make a company deposit. There were some bloodstains in the car and that led police to fear that he had been abducted. HLNP officials showed off the nearly completed nuclear power generating plant near Bay City today. The plant, years behind schedule and billions of dollars over its estimated cost, is expected to finally begin operation in about 18 more months. Tonight at 10 on Eyewitness News, Baytown City officials expecting a heated session when they meet tonight to discuss a contract for city ambulance service. Wayne Dolcefino will have a live report on that story and we'll have more tonight at 10. Final item here this evening, those people who receive the home delivered meals each day in the Meals on Wheels program got a bit of an extra treat today. Transamerica Floral Imports donated hundreds of long-stemmed roses delivered to the Meals on Wheels program by the Freeway Rescue Service for distribution to all those less fortunate who received the home-delivered meals. 81-year-old Aaron Henderson is one of the volunteers who delivers the meals every day. And today, in addition to the hot meal, he was able to give those on his list, including Ms. Marie Moses here, a couple of beautiful red roses. It made their day a little bit brighter, and we wanted to share it with you. And that's Eyewitness News for this evening. We thank you for being with us. Hope you'll join us again tonight at 10. Until then, good evening.
Those red-hot Astros back home in the Dome. Details at 10.